Thanks for joining us, everybody. We are here on our weekly live stream with uh, Matthew Taylor uh, and Corey Cruz from Bad TXV on TikTok. Uh, Matthew's Hello. becoming quite the regular guest. And at some point, we're going to figure out why his video is fuzzy, but uh, it's okay. We're just going to live with it. Um, so today, we're talking about a very, very highly requested topic, which is variable frequency drives and inverters. And I want to start with Matt. Matthew's going to kind of take us through some of the fundamentals. Um, but I want to start with like when people think about uh, and I'll just say this as a statement rather than asking it as a question. But like when residential techs or like commercial techs talk about ECMs, electronically commutated motors, uh, or they talk about inverter driven compressors, um, you're really still talking about a variable variable frequency drive. So for those of you who are watching this, you're like, hey, this is getting really in the weeds here. I don't do commercial. It's the same basic principles. Basically, you just take. Uh, a variable frequency drive and you put it in a box, you engineer it and manufacture it as part of either the motor um, and the module. So that module is kind of a VFD. I mean, it really is a VFD attached to a motor and an ECM uh, or with an inverter driven compressor, you're basically just packaging it into the condensing unit. Whereas what we're going to talk about today is a little bit more kind of breaking those uh, constituent pieces apart and uh, and talking about them individually a little bit more. Um, did, I, did I say anything wrong there, Matthew? I love it. Uh, you know, that was going to be one of my punchlines as we were working through this. We do use these things uh, in residential ECM motors. You know, they they're a version. They are a version of this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I already know a couple people watching uh, specifically if any of our friends from Regal are here. Uh, Matthew said ECM motor because that's what we call it in the field. And yes, we do know when we say that we're saying <laughs> yeah. motor motor. OK, we know we're saying motor motor and we're fine with it. We like it. We like I got it. a hot water heater in my garage, too. Sorry. Right. Right. Um, quick question for you, Corey. Barf. Yeah. Yeah. Hot water. Heater. <laughs> I actually I'm just uh, it's an old joke. Had to throw it in there. That's a heat reclaim supermarket guy. Uh, and the TXV valve valve. Heating my hot water. <laughs> yes. The TXV valve. Yes. Yes. TXV valve valve. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, a, a hot water heater is a water heater wearing a bikini. I've seen that one. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I laughed. I know. It's so stupid. Um, our director of plumbing just the other day. Uh, posted something. He's like, I want to do a promo for hot water heaters. And I was like, yeah, you're gonna be lucky if you have a job tomorrow, man, like, I right? don't know. Um, I don't know. But anyway, so I wanted to ask you this first, Corey, do you sure. ever call a variable frequency drive a freak drive? No. Well, I haven't, but I probably will now. I really just think that I really like that term. <laughs> Okay. I heard it for a, a while. Freak drive. Yeah, I, I did. I heard it for, I, I heard somebody say it and I was like, oh man, what is that? It sounds like something from a sci-fi movie. And yeah. I, I got the next like, t-shirt oh, idea. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Super freak, super freak, super freak. Yeah. 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 Man, we have so I many like ideas it. there. Uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, we're going to, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to dive into it. Let's stop being silly and advance the slides and do this thing. All right. So Matthew, yeah. So on to you. This is a sine wave. We all know what that is, right? Uh, so this is our AC current. And, and if we look at this particular one, and I threw this one together, uh, there's a couple things I want to point out about it. Uh, this is just one leg uh, of 483 phases, what we're looking at here. And, and when we, as field technicians, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk all night as a field technician. So all these guys that are really hung up on the using the right word and, you know, all the right things, the engineering level stuff, that's not what we're really after here. We're really trying to get a practical application of this. So when I, when I'm looking at this 483 phase and I put my meter across two of these legs, I'm going to see on this drawing, you know, about 480 volts. Uh, but what I wanted to point out uh, on this is, is a couple interesting things. One is, that's not actually the peak voltage, even though we tend to see it drawn that way. Uh, the peak voltage is actually a lot higher than that. It's square root of two times uh, our that line voltage that we see is actually the peak voltage that we're going to get. So that's just an interesting piece that does come into play a little bit later when we get into the VFD. So I want to point that out. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is RMS. You know, we're buying meters. RMS, it's calculating RMS. What is that? What are we talking about? Uh, well, when we look at this sine wave, the top half of this thing uh, is positive voltage, right? Well, if we look at that and we kind of guess what the average voltage of that sine wave is, uh, that's going to be about 480 volts. Well, RMS is just a technical way of 
chopping that bottom half off and making it positive, making it an absolute value. That's really all we're doing. We're squaring it and then finding the square root of it. Well, that just takes our negative 480 and makes it positive 480. That's all that we're doing there. So when we use our meter and we're measuring this, we're actually measuring the mean, which is very similar to an average on a sine wave. Uh, so it, it's really not inaccurate to think of it as the average. That's, you know, that's kind of what we're doing. So when we stick our meter on AC voltage, we're actually reading the average of, of the high side, so to speak, the positive side. Uh, we don't see the plus or the minus on our meter, uh, you know, because it would, it would have to flash back and forth. If we look at the, what's the average of this sine wave, the average is zero, right? And it's zero for every uh, voltage that we have. That's just not useful. You know, if I stick my meter on there and it says zero volts, uh, yeah, what does that mean? Yeah, I'm probably, right. probably about to get shocked. So, so we got to have a way to measure that. And, and we don't really care about that peak. We want to know what that what the actual voltage is of that half wave or, or half period there. Uh, and the other piece I wanted to just clarify before we move on much farther uh, is when we're talking about a Hertz, uh, we're, we're talking about one of these sine waves, right? Uh, and in the electrical world, what a Hertz or Hertz uh, actually is the correct terminology. It doesn't sound right for one, but it is, uh, is, is how many of these in a, in a uh, second, that we've got going on. So 60 Hertz, you know, we're gonna have 60 of these cycles in that one second period. That's what that is. Uh, so just defining that because that's what we're gonna be manipulating later is how many of these we're cramming into a second. You know, we, we may put 80 in there, we may put 20 in there. You know, what's that about? Well, th well, that means that they're just getting tighter and tighter, smaller and smaller, but their voltage, these peak voltages on AC would be the same. So I just wanted to cover those few points before we move on. So when we start moving on uh, and we, we're talking about manipulating that, we all understand that's what's going on. Yeah, I wanted to add quickly a couple things because something I don't want to rush past. Matthew said this, and it's a really key point. If we were to look at the average, it would be zero. Well, why is that? Because you have a positive sign and a negative sign, a negative uh, side of the sine wave. That's why that would be. And so when we're calculating RMS, we're basically saying, what would the effective voltage be if it were DC? Like if it were constant, what would the effective useful voltage be? Uh, and that's important, especially, and, and again, like there was a period of time when we were like, oh, true R RMS meters, that's such a big deal versus an averaging meter. Well, nowadays, I mean, like yeah, almost everything's true RMS. It's not like, that's not as big of a deal as it used to be to discuss. But when you start to talk about um, this this word, and I don't know that I say this word right, so correct me if I'm wrong. But when you start talking about non-sinusoidal sinusoidal waveforms, uh, it gets really interesting. And, and actually, one of the, I'm just going to throw out a use case here quickly. Uh, to bring it back to the resi guys uh, if you've ever tried to measure power on a ecm or on an inverter driven compressor uh, and you're thinking to yourself well i'm measuring on the ac side i'm measuring on the input right and so because i'm measuring on the input it's not going to be affected by what's going on in that inverter well, let me tell you if you start looking at meters that can measure power factor or meters that can measure frequency hertz um, you're going to start to see some crazy stuff because what happens on the other side uh, actually does affect your measurements in your meter and you will see really low power factors. We're not going to talk about power factor today, but what it comes down to is, is that you're, this is one of the reasons why in residential, if you've ever noticed you're working on like a, uh, an ECM blower and you look at the, uh, the amperage rating, the current rating, and it's very high. One of the reasons is that, well, that motor can ramp up so it can, it can, uh, use more power in order to speed up. But one of the other reasons is, is that they have really poor power factor. Like they actually, uh, they don't, meaning what you're going to see in terms of your current doesn't translate to what you use in terms of wattage. And all this, what this uh, actually ends up meaning is this whole, let's just kind of simplify the message here, understanding that what goes on after this AC part, this next part that Matthew's going to talk about really can affect your measurements. And if you think that measuring uh, current and voltage and wattage and power factor and frequency on a ECM or a um, variable frequency driven motor is the same as doing it on a PSC or your old school motors, you're going to be very wrong. Like it's, it's, it's not the same and you're not going to get the same results. So anyway, that was a long sermon there. Corey, anything to add? No, I mean, uh, on this section, Matthew got it all, all covered. So yeah, all right. we can move on. All right. Good stuff.
All right. So, um, so this, you know, not necessarily VFD related here, but we're going to use this idea farther along. Uh, and what we're talking about here is pulse width modulation. That's a term most of us have probably heard. A lot of us may or may not understand that. So, uh, so I want to take a minute and just cover that. Th this is a the concept here. There's a couple key pieces to understanding pulse width modulation that, that we'll relate later. Uh, the, the first one is this whole idea of analog and digital. You know, this, these are some more words that we hear all the time that can be confusing, uh, you know, kind of run together. I don't know. What, what's, what's this about? All right. So, so digital, when we say the word digital, what we mean is something that's either on or off. It only has two positions. All right. This comes from the computer world where we've got transistors, you know, switches that, we, that the computer just turns on or off with zeros and ones. You know, that's it. That's why it speaks binary. It doesn't really matter for us. What matters to us is I got a contactor and that contactor is either fully on or, or it is not. Right. That's digital. Uh, so that would be the, that would be an example of a digital output. Uh, and then when we talk about analog, what we're talking about are, are things that don't have that locked in value, like 50%. Well, I can have 51%. I can have 50.01%, right? I, you know, I can have this wide range of things. And in, in our world, techni technicians, temperature, right? Temperature is a, is a really good example of an analog input. Okay. So the, the concept be between for pulse with modulation is basically converting that analog idea into something that's actually digital. So for instance, if I want a fan motor to run at 50%, the fan motor, we're not talking about VFDs here or ECMs or anything else, all right, just a regular motor. Uh, if I want that motor to run at 50%, uh, I can either turn the voltage down halfway and then my amps go up and then I burn it up, right? So that doesn't work. Uh, or, or another idea would be to turn it on and turn it off and then turn it back on and turn it off and turn it on, turn it off. So, so what does that look like? Well, when we, when we talk about pulse with modulation, we have cycles kind of like Hertz, but they're not tied to this, to the second. Uh, okay. So, so I could have a cycle and my cycle can vary quite a bit. I'll use a 10 second cycle here just to make it simple. All right. So if I've got a 10 second cycle, that means in that cycle, I'm going to run that motor 50%. I'm going to run it for five of those 10 seconds. And then I'm going to turn it off for five. And then it's going to repeat five on five off, five on five off. If I do that, then that fan motor is actually running at 50%, even though it only has the ability to run either on or off. Right. So I've converted my analog to my digital. Uh, real common place that we see this compressor unloaders. Copeland is famous for the digital compressor, right? Uh, we're, we're unloading the suction. We're, we're turning off the suction. We're leaving the motor run the whole time so we don't get that startup in rush uh, and all that. Uh, we just take away the refrigerant so it's not doing any work for a portion of its cycle. And Copeland chose 20 seconds, right? So at 50%, it would load for 10 seconds and then it unloads for 10 seconds. Uh, you know, at 75, uh, going to 15 seconds on five off, right? 25, I'm on for, for five and then off for seven, you know. So so that's the concept between, uh, you know, taking something that's, that's analog, like voltage, AC voltage, right? Which got, got this nice even sine wave. Uh, and, and I'm just turning it on and off, turning it on and off, right? That's that pulse width modulation. That's what it is. A good example of this is, um, for people who, uh, worked with old dimmers, your old rheostat type of dimmers that had, uh, actual variable resistance, right? And it was analog where, if, as you turn that knob, the resistance would just smoothly turn up and down. And you remember good old incandescent light bulbs where it's just it's just nice and smooth, right? I mean, inefficient is all get out, but just nice and smooth as much as you wanted. And then when we all went to LEDs or fluorescence, we we're like, these darn things don't work anymore, you know? And then we go to uh, now your modern dimmers, which function much more like this, where you're actually operating on a duty cycle. You're actually... Um, on and off. And so that's where you start to get flicker and you get all this weird stuff that we now see nowadays in modern and modern dimmers because they are digital. They're functioning digitally, not on this smooth curve. I like to use an example of like using a jump rope. You know, everything that we did in alternating current is like this. It's like this smooth jump rope. Right. And it's just this. And if you want it to be a higher frequency, you just spin a little faster. Right. And it becomes more frequent. 
And it's this very smooth thing because uh, analog or uh, AC is produced in a rotating magnetic field, right? We have these we have these generators and this rotating magnetic field, which creates this smooth sign. Whereas, uh, you know, that w when you're dealing with PWM, it would be like a demon possessed jump rope. We were a kid's like up in the sky <laughs> and on the ground. I'm just imagining like ground sky, ground sky, ground sky, right? <laughs> you don't you don't have this smooth, you know, uh, you don't have this smooth uh, uh, kind of flow. I did want to also use the example, use the example of digital scroll, but talk about um, because I just did a, a short podcast that isn't out yet, but on um, pulse uh, electronic expansion valves is another example of this concept of going to digital away from analog. Talk about that quickly. Yeah. Hey, Corey probably can, can speak a little bit about pulse valves. You want you want to do that one? Um, I mean, it's basically the exact same, except we're feeding a, instead of having a motor um, or a mechanical TXV, all we are doing is um, opening up essentially a solenoid to allow the refrigerant to flow through an orifice um, for, for size. And every predetermined amount of time in the program, so typically what you'll see is around six seconds, um, we will have a uh, that solenoid open up, which will allow the refrigerant through, goes through the orifice and into the evaporator coil just like normal. Um, but what this does is it gives us a lot tighter control um, of our superheat and uh, load, especially um, another benefit of that is if you have multiple circuits. Um, it's just a it's an overall more efficient way to uh, refrigerate. And that's where a lot of the technology is going towards, um, you know, the days of mechanical valves, they're still there. Um, but, it, and it's going to get to residential. I think residential already has, uh, quite a few brands that are doing electronic valves and stuff like that. But, um, I'm not sure where the technology is in the residential field, as far as pulse valves are concerned, but essentially think of the pulse valves as just a solenoid on and off every, six seconds control on the flow and uh yeah that's about that's honestly all there is to it pretty much yeah it's, <laughs> a, it's just another illustration of this uh concept of digital versus analog right a txv is an example of an analog valve where there's a balance of forces and those balance of forces create this kind of flow of open and close it could be in any of a million different positions right and this balance of forces but both are pulse valve and our stepper valve. Jeff brought up stepper valves, not the same thing. Pulse valve is literally full open or full close. Stepper valve is still digital in the sense that it has discrete steps, right? So there's- Would these... that be like an EEV? Well, it is. These are both versions of EEVs. Okay. So um, a pulse valve and a stepper are both types of EEVs, whereas a pulse valve is completely open, just like what we see on the screen for a period of time and completely closed for a period of time. And that's digital, an example of digital a stepper valve has these discrete number of steps that it can make between full open and full closed, which while it's not digital in the way we're seeing right here, it is still digital in the sense that there are these little stair steps of open and closed that are, that are discrete. That's the term that you use in, in digital uh, technology. It's like these distinct kind of latches, distinct steps versus this kind of flowing curve that we see in alternating current or in traditional mechanical type valves. And yeah, digital and, on off analog, anything that has a current right. or um, that it's referencing or a constant current or voltage or signal, that's going to be your analog and then digital on off on off on off. Yeah, analog so, could be anything. It could be 1.75632 volts, right? It could be, uh, you know, it could be anything one zero. scale where digital's like one, two, three, four, you know, uh, and that's what we see in a stepper valve and a pulse valve. It's, is it open? Is it closed? What is the duty cycle? Like we showed yep. here, how, how, what percentage of the time is it open over a particular cycle? So and, anyway, and, we went off on that, but I think it's really important to get that because I went so long not knowing the difference between analog and digital. Like it just it never really clicked with me, which is why we're really hammering this because this is very key as we move forward. Go ahead, Matt. And 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 the purpose behind all of this is 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 essentially increased control. Like to your point, Corey, you're seeing a lot of this in in market refrigeration because um, that's just an area where you're going to want a higher degree of control versus like a residential system where it might not be as important. Yeah, and the refrigerant. Um... You know that refrigerant moves a lot slower in the coil 
Um, we don't need to constantly uh, be metering. I, I should say, I mean, you're always metering, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. We're allowing that refrigerant to r really boil off, um, which has the added benefit of giving us that tighter control um, and more consistent superheat across the board. I want to answer the question that Matt asked, though, specifically, uh, but more broadly, right? So the question is, why digital rather than analog? Because digital isn't always better than analog. But what we're talking about today, as it relates to VFDs, why do we want that? And it's simply because we want control over frequency. Uh, if we're using utility power, which is this nice, smooth sine wave, we just get what they give us, right? And we don't have a lot of control, especially over efficiency. Um, but there's ways we can control speed, but it's always kind of sloppy. Whereas if we take that and we make it digital, then we can really control it. We can really control the speed of these motors. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Matthew here to kind of, uh, do we move on to the next slide? Where do we go here? Yeah, I think we probably cover, covered that one pretty well. All right. All right. So this is a rectifier. If anybody's ever seen one drawn, uh, this particular one is a three phase rectifier. So it's a little more complex than your typical rectifier, right? Uh, well, a couple things about this idea. Uh, one of the terms that we we call this thing is an inverter, right? Well, technically, anytime we're going from one type of AC to DC or DC to AC, that's actually an inverter. Uh, so we're actually looking at a very simple version, uh, extremely simple version of an inverter. That's uh, not why we call it an inverter. There's actually a far more complex one farther downstream. But I just want to make sure we all understand that really the word inverter is really just talking about going from AC to DC or DC to AC. That's what it is. Well, that's what a rectifier does, right? Uh, and this isn't the, uh, the end all, but the majority of the VFDs that we see as technicians in this trade uh, are using something very similar to this really simple design. Uh, we've got six diodes in here uh, and, you know, you, you can jump on YouTube and see animations of how, you know, the AC flows when it's positive and then it reverses when it's negative and how these traps, you know, these diodes act as check valves and, and cause us to get an output that is DC. Uh, but because our AC uh, has got this sine wave, right, our DC is only making DC when the when our sine wave is positive it's only making that positive side and then it makes the negative side one on the other side so so we don't get real dc that's you know that's a, a little bit of a misnomer we think about it you know when you plug in your battery charger to charge your car and you hook that you know hook that up it's not really dc it's pulsing at 60 hertz right um so it's it's close it's close but it's not exactly that uh and, and i wanted to show this drawing just for a minute so um you know when we troubleshoot a vfd one of the one of the common failures of a VFD is we we fry one of these diodes or or all of them. Uh, they get they get nailed from bad power or lightning, you know, whatever. Um, we can check that. You know, we we got a diode checker right there on our multimeter most of the time. A lot of us don't use it for much, but uh, here's a here's a great place to do that. Uh, you know, we can put our our meter on that DC bus. You know, on this drawing over there on the right hand side. Uh, and check the diode and see if it's blocking. You know, do we have zero uh, or am I reading something? And if I'm reading something, the diode's not working, uh, then I know I've, I've smoked the, the diodes. Uh, some of these VFDs, like the one, uh, you know, in Corey's background picture, there, that that uh, that Danfoss, I can change I can change those diodes. It's that, you know, technicians don't typically do that, but you can uh, if you can diagnose that that is your failure point, right? So uh, so the first step in almost every VFD setup is going to be some type of rectifier that's just taking that AC voltage and turning it into a fairly crappy DC voltage. That's, you know, that's really uh, that conversion there. Now, what is that voltage coming out of there? It's going to be that peak voltage that I, I showed you in that drawing. It's not uh, it's not that average, right? It's going to give us that peak, uh, and it's going to follow that sine wave somewhat. So it's going to then fall off uh, dramatically, right? Uh, and that's that's really not useful to feed anything. So we're going to have to have uh, you know something in uh, after this to help clean that up and give us some you know a little closer to real DC voltage. But that's that first part uh, is technically an inverter. Uh, just to so we don't confuse that with the really complex inverter on the other end, we're we're typically going to call that a 
converter is what we're going to call that, even though, uh, you know, I don't know, whatever. Uh, a rectifier is its real name, uh, and you'll hear it called that too. And there's probably 50 other slang terms that uh, have been developed to talk about it. But but the input, you know, my voltage is coming into this thing, AC voltage. Uh, I've got to convert it to DC. That first step is my converter uh, or my rectifier. Uh, and, you know, on the ECM motor we were talking about, if you pull that cover off there, the first thing you're going to see is a set of diodes, you know, if they're doing the same thing. Uh, when you when Corey opens his cover right behind him on that giant Danfoss drive, I'm going to be looking at diodes. They're, you know, they're right there. Uh, that's what's going on with that with that first stage uh, of what this is. And I'm going to I'm going to simple it up and resi it up here for uh, for our folks watching. Um, the first thing that we're doing here is we're taking alternating current, which is this nice smooth thing. And we're, and we're trying to get it as close to DC as possible. And this is just the sloppy first step, right? This is just the first thing we do in order to take it from AC and turn it into something that we can start to turn into DC because our goal is to now take that DC and be able to switch it so that we can get something that simulates different frequencies in order to spin motors different speeds specifically what we're talking about here uh cory you can jump in anytime otherwise we're just going to keep rolling yeah let's clean up that dc voltage let's clean it up that's it so our, our second stage is going to be what we call the bus uh and and another terminology you're going to hear is filters right um this is really just some complex capacitors are, are what we're doing here. Uh, so, you know, looking at my my first drawing, if we look at that, the top of that sine waves over there, you know, 690 some volts, uh, I may only need, you know, that 460 is what I'm trying to go for. Maybe 550 on VFDs, we might get up to 600, but but I'm not really going to that, that highest peak. I'm not, not using that, even though it's generating it. So I'll, I'll put a capacitor in there and I'll store that little power up at the very top. Uh, and then I'll feed it out after my sine wave starts to drop. Uh, as it starts to go down, uh, I'll, my capacitor will throw that little extra power back in there and kind of flatten those tops out a little bit. As long as my frequency is fast enough, I can kind of cover that gap, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if my if I don't have enough of those sine waves, they're not fast enough, that gap really starts to drop. And that's one of the reasons why you know, full VFDs, the most efficient operation is always going to be three phase power uh, because I've got one of these little, little hills coming every 60 degrees, you know, 120, remember there, but we're flipping the negative to the positive. So, you know, every 60 degrees, I'm getting one of these little, these little mountains. So there's spacing in between them is very small. Uh, if I go to single phase power, you know, 120, even worse, one of these things uh, I'm going to get, my capacitors can't keep up and I'm in my, my quote clean DC is going to be really ugly uh, and and not very efficient. So uh, you know the most efficient way that I can do this is three phase power. That's why uh, you know when you have an ECM motor, for instance, you'll see they're advertising it's a three phase DC motor or whatever. Uh, they're yeah. three phase, right? They're generating three phases uh, in because we get those mountains close together. That we're you know it's just more efficient that way. Hardly ever we're going to see that hook to a, a conventional single phase motor but it can work it's just less efficient yeah one of the things i wanted to one of the examples i want to give because capacitors are just my favorite topic anyone who knows me i just love capacitors because they're given so much credit that they don't deserve uh what a capacitor really is regardless of the type is it's just a storage device okay people like it does not increase your voltage it doesn't do any magic people talk about phase shift okay the capacitor doesn't magically do phase shift the, the way that the capacitor shifts phase is simply because it stores and then releases, right? Because it stores at peak. And then as that sine wave goes the other way, now it's releasing again. That's all it's doing. Think of it like a pressure tank. Anybody who lives in the country, like a hillbilly like me, knows that when you have a, a well, uh, you have your well going on and off, right? And in order to kind of like keep the pressure up, you have a pressure tank and it helps store that pressure and then release it slowly. That's what your capacitors are doing. And yeah, you make it complicated and you have multiples and whatever. And so that way you can try to flatten it out more. But ultimately, all a capacitor is, is just a little pressure tank. Uh, and the bigger the capacitor, the more current it can handle. That's all. So when you see really high microfarads, that's all that means is it just can handle more current in and out. It doesn't boost anything. It doesn't do anything else magical. Uh, and, that, and when you think of it that way, imagine this like a pump on top 
and then the second one is a pump where you added some pressure tanks to it. That's basically what you did. Very nice. Very nice. Now, I, I don't live where I have a well, so I like to think of it completely inaccurately, but I like to think of it as a really fast battery. <laughs> it's just a really fast battery. I'm going to throw some electricity in there and I'm going to yank it right back out. Right. You know, that's that's. Yeah, no, nice. that's that is actually very accurate. Yeah, for sure. All right. OK, so, uh, yeah, now we now we got some other stuff going on. What do we got here? This is uh, this is all three parts of, of our primary VFD. So that I've got my rectifier. That's the first part we've already talked about. The, that bus in the middle, this is way oversimplified, but that's a capacitor right in the center of there uh, that's, that's kind of balancing that out. And, and then I've got that last piece where a lot of stuff's going on. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, that's the part that we typically actually call the inverter. Uh, so when, when somebody says, I got an inverter, I got a drive, you know, what, what are they talking about? That's really, they're really talking about this piece. Uh, most of our VFDs, well, all of our VFDs are going to have the, all three of these parts. That inverter, uh, what it's doing, what its capability is, how, you know, how micro processing it can be really is is very different from one end of the spectrum to the other. They vary tremendously here. There's also a lot of dollars involved in in making these very, very, very uh, precise uh, and giving us more control. Whether we need that or not depends on which type of drive that we ultimately decide to go with. But, you know, but, but let's look at that for a minute. So if we look at the at the bottom of this drawing, we see the sine waves, right? Well, that's that AC sine wave we started out with coming in. Uh, and then our second one is doing just what I talked about. Uh, it's just taking the negatives and flipping them up top. Uh, and then we're chopping off the tops, you know, the very tops of those things. That's going through my, my filter or my bus. Uh, and then I'm going to feed that DC voltage into this inverter. So, uh, so let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, what I've got going on here is... Uh, I've got my three legs of power going to my my motor, right? Uh, but I'm going to feed that DC voltage instead of AC voltage. Well, I'm going to try to simulate that sine wave the best that I can with blocks <laughs> instead of a nice sine wave. Well, what is that? How am I going to do that? Uh, well, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to send it positive voltage, and then I'm going to send it negative voltage. Send it positive voltage, and I'm going to send negative voltage. And the frequency that that happens is my frequency, right? That's my hertz. Uh, so so I can manipulate how quickly I switch back and forth doing that. Uh, I, I just have switches in this thing. That's, that's all I got. I got switches that I just open and close really, really fast. Uh, and my computer is controlling them so I can determine how quickly I want that to happen. Uh, and that's why I get this blocky sine wave uh, because I, I'm, I'm just feeding it DC voltage. It's that voltage that's that my peak voltage that my capacitor cleaned up. Uh, and, and that's what I'm I'm sending out there, right? That's all I got to work with. There, you, you see, there's no dimmer switch in here like he was talking about earlier. There's no rheostat. It's not turning that voltage down. I'm getting that, you know, 600 and some volts. That's what's coming out of this 480 drive. Uh, and that's why my blocks are all even at the top. If we look at that sine wave, they're all even at the top. Well, we know we're not feeding that motor with 600 and some volts all the time. Uh, actually, we are. Uh, when we measure that, we're not going to measure it that way. We're going to see the average. We're going to see that RMS, right? Uh, and we can change that voltage tremendously using our pulse width modulation we can make that voltage match, uh, that average voltage match my sine wave much, much closer on my meter, my RMS. You know, the average, if I chop, instead of taking one full hurt and making that a cycle, using my duty cycle, I'm going to break that sine wave into multiple duty cycles. And, and, and in my sine wave, let's say for my 480, if my average voltage in the first part of that sine wave was 100 volts, then I'll set up a duty cycle that gives me a hundred volts in that same period of my sine wave. Uh, and I'll, and I'll see my meter will show me a hundred volts right there. Right. Uh, my oscilloscope will too. It'll show me that that's at a hundred volts. And then I'll move on to the next part of my sine wave that's climbing. Uh, and, and my pulses will get larger of that 600 volts. Right. So the average now becomes 400 then, then 500 and whatever I need. So I can, I can determine the voltage I'm sending using that pulse width modulation and the sophistication of the computer that is driving this uh, will tell me how many of those duty cycles I can break a single Hertz into. 
right? So a real basic drive is only going to is only going to take the top of that sine wave and break it into three duty cycles. That's kind of a you know standard, uh, but a very sophisticated drive may break that into a hundred uh, and give me really really fine uh, DC voltage. If my application requires it. In our world, as uh, air conditioning, refrigeration guys, we're running semi erratic compressors. We're running condensing fan motors. You know, we're, we're running. We don't need. We don't need that. Uh, so, so our system, our duty cycles are not going to be extreme. We're not going to have that massive. You know, hundred uh, in, inside one of these things. But you know, three would be pretty common. You know, we, we will see that quite a bit. Um, so on our on our output side. Uh, you know, a couple key takeaways here on, on my output side. Uh, I'm going to be sending that that very high voltage. Uh, and if I've got a good meter, if I've got a meter that's designed to read it, well, you know, that's what I mean. Uh, and, you know, you probably add a zero to whatever you spend on your meter if you want one of those. Um, it will show you that the peak voltage you can choose. That's a selection you can choose. And it will give you that this thing is, is cranking out 620 volts all the time, you know. Um, but most of the time we're going to RMS, and if it's you know if it's going to calculate that for a VFD, yeah, it's going to look at that, and it's going to use the 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 it's going to look at those duty cycles and give me half of one wave, right? And it'll give me the actual voltage that the computer is trying to simulate, and that's what I'll actually see. That's useful. That's very useful uh, when we're troubleshooting this, and and we'll talk a minute uh, in a minute why that voltage is not. Uh, you know, always up there where we want it, you know, if, well, I say where we want it, where we're 460, for instance, if I got a 460 motor, why are we not sending that thing, uh, an average of 460 all the time? Uh, you know, that's, that can be a problem. Uh, we hadn't talked about why, just to understand that we have to manipulate that voltage uh, and we've got to make that average change, right? Uh, this is how we do it through pulse width modulation, using the computer only digital, it's all it's got, switches on or off, on or off, right? Uh, but I want to send out this nearly analog voltage, right? Well, I'm going to do that through through my pulse width modulation uh, that, that we've already talked about. So that's that's how those pieces and parts work. Uh, those switches that I'm, I, I was talking about, they're not really switches, they're transistors. Um, and there's some really complex transistors that have come along that have, uh, have made... VFD is so much more practical uh, and so much uh, so much more reliable and so less expensive. You know, they used to be very, very exotic machines. Uh, today, they're, they're getting more and more common just because the technology of those switches has gotten to be affordable and, and much faster. Uh, and, and that makes computer processing uh, also has caught up. Uh, so, so think about that. If I'm changing my frequency, um, I, I don't have to be slave to 60 hertz anymore either. I can go past that, right? So if I'm going 80, 90 of these cycles in one second and I'm breaking that up into multiple duty cycles inside of that, that computer has got to fire those switches really, really fast and extremely accurately, right? Uh, and, and that technology really has is fairly, you know, more recent, you know, say 10 years, last 10 years, that's really gotten common. Uh, so, so we're going to start seeing these more and more and more applications uh, because of the energy efficiency. Uh, when we don't need these at 100%, we don't need a motor running at 100%, we save a tremendous amount of power. Uh, in, in the past, the, the capital outlay to get this going, uh, the complexity of it and the reliability prevented us from using them, right? But today, because that's no longer the case, uh, we're going to see these more and more and more. Uh, and, and as energy requirements in the residential world, uh, you know, keep climbing, uh, you're going to, you're definitely going to start seeing this type of thing. Um, because, you know, I'm in, in, in this example, by the way, that I'm showing on this is a really common version of the, the VFD that we use in air conditioning. But this is also the three phase version. Uh, you know, there's a couple things to note. I can have a single, uh, a regular rectifier uh, on a single phase system that's going to produce the same DC voltage, right? The bus is going to clean it up the same. And then the output inverter on the other end doesn't even know that it was single phase coming in. It just won't care. Uh, so if that's the case, that opens up residential, right? Uh, you know, I can run this thing on 240 AC. Yeah, absolutely all day long. Uh, and it will work, right? It'll work just fine. Uh, the bus doesn't, uh, the bus is going to clean that up. Uh, my, my, my little sine wave that I showed you earlier is not going to be quite as DC-ish. It's going to be a little less DC-ish. Um, 
but it's it's still going to function. It'll it'll lose a little efficiency when we do that, uh, but it's still going to function. So uh, so we're going to see those type of of things, you know, getting into non commercial application, um, and, and and we are already right. You know, we're already seeing that in compressors uh, that are running off VFDs right? and ECM motors, as you as you've already uh, talked about. These parts exist in my. This very drawing would plug right into my ECM motor. Uh, wait a minute. They say my ECM motor is, uh, I keep saying that over and over, right? My ECM, I'll try <laughs> to stop saying motor. Uh, motor, motor. My, my, my ECM uh, is advertised to be a DC motor, right? Well, I'm simulating AC right here, right in the bottom of this drawing. I'm showing you it's AC, right? Uh, well, the other thing the sales guy, it's a DC motor, and we pull it by by varying our frequency. How do you have a DC motor running frequency? You know, right? There is no frequency in DC, right? right. So, so it's obvious. Yeah, you know, we're 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 using DC just like uh, we are in a regular VFD. That's the DC part of that. Now, the the motor itself that they're building is a true DC motor, uh, and and it is not a regular AC motor, and they do that to take advantage of the efficiency of this. Uh, right. It makes it even more efficient. Most of the VFDs that we're talking about, we're hooking up to AC motors. Right. Uh, and, and an ECM is actually a, a purpose-built DC motor, uh, but it's doing the same thing. You know, we're driving that with a three-phase sure. Uh, and we're simulating this, you know, this this AC sine wave with DC volts. It's doing the, doing the same thing. So you, you pull the cover off there. I told you, you'll see the diodes. What's the next thing you're going to see? Capacitors. Well, there's your bus, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then, you know, your output's going to be three wires. Uh, yeah, three phase. That's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. So yeah, you'll hear people so, say things like, uh, you know, brushless DC. You'll hear all these different terms. It's like, okay, ultimately what it comes down to is, was this motor engineered to work with a vfd uh ecm whatever you want to call it was it engineered to work with the drive uh then it's built slightly differently um but it's still using magnets it's still driving a motor around in a circle using uh, using magnetic fields like it's just a slightly different design uh, whereas in the commercial world, uh, in many cases, we're taking motors that were really sp specifically designed to run on AC. Like they were not purpose built for a drive and we're putting a drive on it. Um, so there is some there is some difference there. Um, I wanted to back up quickly again, and I keep doing this, but I, I just want to hammer home once again. Um, what we're saying with all of this is it's like you're trying to build. I don't know if anybody grew up playing with Legos, but I played with a lot of Legos as a kid. And the first time, time you try to make a car with Legos... Like it's really blocky, right? It's like it's like really it doesn't really look like a car, but you get better. So you learn if you make it a little bigger and you you kind of do smaller steps, you can kind of simulate a curve, you know, you can kind of make it look smooth. You know, you can actually make a Ferrari out of it. And that's what we're doing, right? The more complicated these systems get, the more we're simulating a curve, but still with these discrete on-off steps, right? We're still doing it that way. Uh, and as we get more um, robust and especially when we engineer it for these systems, then they work better uh, early on. And, and even like when I, I'll go back to what I said on residential when I was doing a lot of testing with power quality meters and stuff, it's like, man, you see some crazy stuff because there wasn't a lot of thought put into, um, all right, well, yeah, it works, but how do you actually measure some of this? Uh, whereas in the commercial world, uh, they've actually had to retrofit with variable frequency drives. So they've had to think about uh, how to do this and how to test it and all of that. Uh, and it's a little bit more well uh, built out and a little bit better understanding. Um, but it's still the same fundamental technology. And I just want to keep driving that home. Uh, it's either analog, smooth waves provided by the utility, or it's digital, these uh, PWMs that are trying to simulate uh, curves, trying to simulate those waves, uh, but ultimately still driving on an electromagnetic field, spinning things around in circles in the case of motors. Um, either either Brian or Matthew, how what makes these more efficient? Yeah, so th there's a, I don't have a graph that shows this on in this deck, sorry. Uh, but there's a, a graph that you can look at that will, will tell you or show you the amount of power that you're consuming versus the amount of work that you're doing, tip typically for electric motors, RPMs, right? You start looking at speed. Well, one of the things that you'll notice is when speed increases, it's exponential. It's not a nice linear line, right? It, it's, it's got this pretty dramatic uh, 
curve at the top. Uh, so th what that means is that when I'm running something, uh, and I'll just throw some numbers out here that actually are on that curve. Uh, if I'm running something at 80% of its capacity, uh, I've, I've come down my curve enough that I'm really only using 30% of the power that I would normally use at 100%. Right. Uh, so just dropping back 20 percent uh, is going to save me an enormous amount of money because it's at the very top of my curve. It's it's at the most inefficient spot uh, on my curve is 100 percent. So the farther I back down from that, uh, that first 20, 30 percent is dramatic. Right. After that, it's not as, it's not as dramatic. My, my power saving, it doesn't compound as I come down or I'd be making money by running it at 50 percent. But if I run it, you know, at 80 percent. Uh, I'm saving a lot of money. Well, when I start looking at why do I need that device spinning, how many times is that at full load? Well, turns out most of our applications, not all that often. You know, sometimes it, we need that full capacity, but but a lot of times we don't. So the the concept here is to tell that VFD when I don't need that full load, let's back it down and let's try to get under that 80 percent and we're going to start really saving energy that's you know that's the whole concept uh behind that's what drives this long before vfds they were trying to do this with mechanical drives you know they were just you know, the mousetrap uh concepts you know were just crazy uh stuff that they were trying to come up with you know with variable uh belt drives and stuff like that. Uh, they, they were trying to take advantage of the same concept. Uh, today, it's just, you know, like I said, electronically, it's just so much uh, more defined and easier to do. Uh, so we can use this, uh, you know, the example we started with, uh, you know, talking about compressors, unloading and loading compressors, uh, making them, you know, uh, act like they're analog when they're digital. Well, an, another version of this is hook the compressor up to a VFD. Uh, and now instead of making it run all the time and, and closing and opening it suction so it does less work, uh, I can actually run this thing at 80% when I don't need it at 100% and save a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, so, so we do see VFDs driving compressors for that reason. Are they more efficient? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, they're, they're tremendously more efficient, right? Is it is a digital compressor more efficient than a non-digital compressor? It is because of the same reason. I can, you know, I can cycle that and not use it 100%, but a VFD will beat it every day. Uh, so th there's more cost involved, right? And there's more, you know, got to be uh, careful about matching things up and whatnot. Whereas I could probably take a digital compressor and drop it right on a refrigeration rack and not change anything else and, you know, add controls for it. And, it, and you got to plug in instant energy savings. It's a lot simpler, a lot more straightforward, and it's easier to maintain. Uh, but if I go that extra step and engineer a VFD and add that, uh, I'm going to save more energy. Uh, it's, it is more efficient. Let me also, there's, there's two other angles I want to take. And the one is a very simple one, which is just basic thermodynamics. I mean, this is like second law of thermodynamic stuff. Um, a lot of people like to talk about like enthalpy and entropy and these really complicated terms. But let's use this really simple thing that we all understand. If you're driving 90 miles an hour down the interstate, uh, are you using more or less fuel than if you're driving 50 miles an hour down the interstate in order to get to the same place? The answer is you're using more fuel, right? Well, why is that? Well, because you have more wind resistance, there's more friction, there's all of these losses, right? So the easiest way when I teach entropy or talk about entropy, it's this fancy sounding thing. And like emo kids love to talk about the entropy in the world, man. But but simply, like as far as for, for our purposes, more enthalpy, meaning more energy input, uh, more differential in temperatures, more force, more anything is also more entropy. You have more losses uh, when you do it that way. And so another simple way is like, hey, what's more efficient? Is it more efficient to run your house at 78 degrees? Or is it more efficient to run your house at 70, then 80, then 70, then 80, then 70, then 80, right? Well, it depends on the exact math there. But but the reason why it's more efficient, because people will say this, why not just make my house really cold? And then that way, it'll just keep up during the warmer parts of the day. Well, the reason is, is because when you create a higher temperature differential between inside your house and outside, your heat transfer is also greater, right? So anytime, it's the reason, one of the reasons why heat pumps are more efficient in some ways than gas furnaces. Like, because if you get your ductwork real hot, then your ductwork is going to give off more of its energy uh, to the surrounding spaces, right? Then if you keep it a little bit cooler in order to do the same work. 
So I'm giving a lot of different examples here, but it's all the same thing. If we don't have to put as much energy in in the first place, we don't lose as much energy. So if you don't need 100% and you can get by with 60, there's this fundamental concept of conservation of energy um, where we're not going to have as much waste. We're not going to have as much entropy if we don't have as much energy input. And that's true of basically everything that we do. But there's this other side too, which is on the equipment side, which is separate from the motor. At this point, we've just been talking about motor efficiency. But there's also this load matching aspect, which is pertinent to the actual equipment as well. So and we know that this is like the main thing. If you have a variable speed compressor and you can load match the space so it doesn't have to go on and off, we know that that's more efficient, right? And that's not just the motor we're talking about. It's not just motor efficiency. It's also system efficiency that that contributes to. And that's a lot of what we're doing in, in spaces like grocery stores. And I want to actually turn this over to Corey. Like, um, like, what are some of the things that we actually do with VFDs effectively uh, in the, the systems we work on? And why does that matter to us? Yeah, so, I mean, disregarding like the, the whole magic that's happening inside of there, the basic principle of what we're trying to accomplish in our industry, whether you're in air conditioning or refrigeration is, is incredibly simple. Most of the time we are controlling a motor, right? Or we are control, uh, you know, whether that be a fan motor or um, like Matthew's, you know, compressor. Um, the biggest and most common things that you'll find these VFDs controlling is your condenser fan motors. Um, and they will typically be taking in a, uh, a signal from a sensor typically mounted. Um, if we're talking condensers or condenser fan motors, we'll be taking a uh, uh, sensor usually like from the drop leg or the liquid line for um, residential guys, you know, and it, it's taking in that input and based on the parameters that you set up, which um, to kind of to get a little sidetracked, you don't, you need to know how exactly how I, I'm, I'm a dumb service guy, right? So Matthew explains all the mechanical stuff and, and all the wizardry that goes in it. Great. And, and it's incredibly incredibly important to know, but don't like to other service guys, don't get discouraged. If you don't just know this thing, like right off, right off the bat, I know what these diodes do with these transistors and gateways and all these other things. The basic principle is still the same, right? Um, you're just controlling a motor or you're trying to fit an application. So like I was saying, with the condenser fan motors, we're taking in we want to uh, limit our head pressure or uh, to a certain dead van, right? We want to keep it within this this uh, range. So, well, how does that happen? If it gets really hot outside, right? We need to speed up those fans. We don't want to have those fans running full speed at all times. If it's 50 degrees outside, we don't need those fans at all times. So you basically have a couple different ways to do that. We can do a on off strategy, kind of like what we talked about, where if let's say we got eight fans, we drop out a fan, you know, every so often based on the temperature, or we can take all those motors and put them up into a VFD, have transducers and sensors referencing that pressure and temperature, whether it be outside air temperature, line temperature, whatever, and ramp them down, ramp them up based on the needs of the system, which leads to increased system performance and uh, energy efficiency, which is what majority of the customers are looking for. But on the service side, it makes that system run so much better. Um, you're not dealing with wild swings. Um, uh, and it also helps negate some of the other service related issues that you may find. I mean, I don't know how many people have seen fan blades like snapped off. Um, you know, we, we run into that sometimes because these things are stopping, they're starting or they're going backwards and then starting again. VFDs essentially eliminate that or they're supposed to. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, lot, I mean, and again, to your point, one of the main things that we uh, use it for, but you can, there's all kinds of different inputs. Uh, uh, David Johnson asked, you know, what are the inputs? Well, it, it depends on what you're doing. If you're controlling a blower, uh, it could be a completely different set of, uh, inputs than if you're controlling a um, condenser fan. But obviously, like yeah. like Corey mentioned, your input on a condenser fan is generally going to be 
um, some approximation of your head or liquid pressure. Uh, and that's going to be what affects, you know, driving your um, driving your motors up and down. But even then, you're not usually just fixing it. It's not like, OK, well, now we're just going to keep this head pressure at exactly here. You're going to let it yes. float down to a certain point um, before uh, you you get more. Yeah. And, and I've it, done another example. I mean, you'll you'll find this typically a lot in the uh, the V side of HVAC, the ventilation side. And I've done this quite a bit. Um, you know, we use VFDs for um, parking garages. So uh, essentially all we're doing is sticking an NO2 and a CO2 sensor um, all over those buildings and parking garages because you have a lot of cars idling. And we're setting those sensors, whatever their alarm calls for, whether it's 100 ppm, 200 ppm or whatever, when one of those sensors will alarm, all it's going to do is send a signal to the digital input of the uh, the VFD, and it's going to reference whatever you programmed into that uh, digital input parameter on the VFD, which is extremely simple, but you need to, I, I, I want to stress this a lot, read your manual, <laughs> because the majority of stuff you'll deal with with VFDs, um, the parameter numbers are going to be different. I mean, that's clear, just like if you're programming a thermostat, right? So you can't say like, oh yeah, I work on a lot of VFDs. I know all the VFDs. There's no way that you will ever know that <laughs> unless you literally do only work on one specific VFD, right? So uh, they all Matthew, essentially Matthew do the Taylor same thing. Know it. Matthew <laughs> definitely <laughs> knows it. He probably wrote the manual. <laughs> no, no, I looked right, up the I'm speed. just saying, <laughs> yeah, I'm saying from a strictly of service standpoint, like the first thing I do when I walk up on a VFD that I suspect has an issue or I want to see it, it's not doing what I want to do is I'm pulling up the manual, right? From there, I can see, okay, well, I'm looking at my most important parameters that I know off the top of my head that I'm going to be looking at. I'm going to look at the, the, the motor rating, the voltage rating, the Hertz rating, the acceleration time, deceleration time, um, you know, all those parameters. There's probably 10 that the majority of us will be messing with on a daily basis out of maybe 300 on most VFDs that you can mess with. A lot of those, that's an engineering thing. They set those to basic settings where a lot of times you might even be able to get away with the basic setup, the setup wizards that most of them have. Um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, you can, you can use them to do a lot of different things. Um, so like I just said, sensor, CO2 sensor, we, hey, we need to turn on a fan and ramp it up whenever these levels get too high. Right. And you could even do it on a, on a, like on a, on a gradient, right? So like as the yeah. levels increase, you increase the speed yep. of the fan. There's a lot of cool things you can do. I, I wanted to quick share a story because I have very limited experience in the, in the things that you guys do. But um, one, one of the first uh, things when I got thrown into a rack house um, was I had that exact, uh, I don't know if it's the exact one, but it looks, I think it was, I think it's that one, um, that oh, Dan boy. Foss VFD. And it was on a big grocery uh, brand that we would all know. And uh, and I was just struggling with this sucker because it had this preset of parameters like <clears throat> these for the client. There was this set of parameters that came in and it was a, a simplified thing and it just wasn't working. Well, I ended up having to go through the parameters uh, menu and mm -hmm. set each one, every single one. And then it, you know, and then it was uh, then it worked. Um, but it was just that simple. It was literally RTFM all over again. Uh, very time consuming, but it often does come down to that. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm no genius on these things. I just went through each parameter until I got them all set in. Yep. Um, I'm going to turn it back to you, Matthew. Anything else uh, that you wanted to, that you wanted to cover on the topic? Yeah, I, I think I mentioned, I could probably talk about this for a couple of hours. There's a lot more, unfortunately, we're about to run out of time. So there are a couple of things I wanted to point out. One, here, here's a picture uh, of that sine wave, you know, with that pulse width modulation, we can see the, the, there's three periods on each one of these. We can see the first one uh, is less voltage than the middle. And then we've got, you know, the, we're following that sine wave down. So our average voltage at both of those points on the ends of that sine wave are going to be less than the middle. Uh, another chunk I wanted to talk about uh, was varying the, the, the voltage with our frequency. That's one of the pieces we don't really think about very often, but, but there's an actual constant uh, of the, the volt to Hertz ratio, all right? And in a 460, uh, 460 volts, 60 hertz power, if we divide that, we're going to get a constant. You know, that constant is 7.67. I wrote it down. Um, 
well, what that means is I got to maintain that constant uh, because I'm generating a magnetic field based on that constant. If I change my frequency, I'm going to change the intensity of my magnetic field. Well, guess what? That's going to re result in a change in current. Well, if I change my current, all right, I, I'm manipulating voltage and hertz. I don't want to manipulate current, right? Uh, if I do that, I can let the smoke out of those wires. Uh, we don't want to do that. So we want we want that current to stay stable, and we're going to do that by following that constant all the way through my frequencies. So, uh, you know, once again, I made some notes here. Thirty At 30 hertz, 460 volts is actually 230 volts. So my pulse width modulation, this pulse width sign that I'm, I'm creating is actually going to average 230 volts at, at 30 hertz. The other thing that we see is when we're programming our VFD, one of the one of our options is is percentage uh, that I can run this motor. And techs get really nervous because often that's well over 100 percent, right? That's 120 we're putting in. Yeah, it's super common, <laughs> right? Well, well, I, that my brain tells me I'm going to burn up that motor if I run at 120 pounds. No, actually, I'm not. Uh, at at 80 hertz, I'm going to feed that thing 613 volts, uh, and that's going to give me 7.67. It's going to keep my constant the same, so my current will be the same, right? I'm going to have less torque. That's the other piece to know. You know, when we're setting all those parameters, uh, I can a, as my hertz fall my torque increases as my hertz climb, my torque decreases at that same constant. Well, I can manipulate that constant just a little bit and get a little more tor torque just to get started, for instance, when I start up. I may yep. throw that constant out the window and go ahead and hit it pretty hard just for a second, right, to get it spinning. And then I'll go back to my constant. Uh, well, that's the same thing as a capacitor. So this is why we're going to use this on that, you know, that single you know, 120 volt, for instance, residential application. Uh, I'm going to get away with not having a capacitor on that little tiny motor uh, because I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fudge that just for a second so I don't burn up the wires. I'm going to drop it right back out. Uh, but just as a technician, when I'm when I'm trying to figure out why I'm not burning this thing up at 120, that's why. I'm maintaining that same magnetic field that's going on inside there, right? Uh, so we didn't we didn't talk about that. Another piece, real quick before we're out of time, uh, you know, the the uh, what's going on with Ford NVA motors burning the bearings out and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what we've got going on there is we're creating a magnetic field on purpose. 480, 60 hertz is going to is a very predictable field that's inside that thing. If we think of it as a, as a stream that's flowing, uh, it's been flowing that way for a long time. It's nice and smooth, everything's even, and then we get this massive rain and we run way more water through there than we should. What's going to happen, or or normally runs through there? What's going to happen is when that water hits spots that it didn't used to at a different speed and velocity, I'm going to get these little eddy currents, right? I'm going to get these weird currents that spin off of that. Uh, well, that's what's going to happen. When we start manipulating our frequency. Our magnetic field is going to create these weird eddies that are just going to happen. Well, one of the reasons why we generate power is we we spin metal inside a magnet and it produces electricity, right? Well, my motor has metal in it and we're spinning it around all these weird magnetic eddies, we're going to generate some current on the shaft that we didn't mean to, right? Uh, and it's and it's going to find its way to, to a ground. Uh, and if, if it's not a VFD rated motor, that's going to be right through the bearings, right? So, you know, when we talk about a VFD rated motor, which by the way, almost every AC motor that's been made in the last four or five years is VFD rated, even if it doesn't say it, uh, it probably is. Uh, so this is kind of a, a problem that's going to age out here, you know, in the future. But if I got a 10 year old motor that's not VFD rated, I could see that, you know, the bearing wear out because of that. That's what that's what that frequency arc or whatever they want to call it. There's lots of terms that people use. That's what it actually is, is the eddies just being created in the magnetic field in the wrong place on a piece of metal. Uh, and that creates electricity. And then that electricity has to find a ground. Yep. And you get you get arcing, but you can also get like what's so interesting with electricity. And we just don't think about this, but like it is directly connected to chemistry. Like when you learn and if you go back to high school chemistry I and mean, remember, like we're talking about, you know, covalent bonds and electrons yeah. and and uh, and, you know, you talk about galvanic corrosion, you know, anodes and cathodes and all this stuff. I mean, like 
there's all of these unintended consequences um, that happen when you start messing with magnetic fields. Somebody was, uh, I think it was uh, Jason. Jason's in here. You know, Jason's clearly an expert on this, and he's like baiting us. Um, but you think about harmonics and you know, you <laughs> multiples, multiples of the base voltage, and you know, you get all these crazy effects. Um, and it, and that's what tends to happen. And like, that's kind of what I was going back to saying to your resi techs out there. Um, you know, start measuring the stuff. You're going to have some fun with it. If you want to get crazy, you can be like Roman and get your oscilloscope out and, and start to kind of understand this a little bit better, but just understand that like, we didn't talk about capacitive reactants. We didn't talk about inductive reactants. We didn't talk about those impacts on fields. This is not an engineering class. We use right. a lot of like close proxies to sort of give you a, a head cartoon about how it works. It's very imperfect. Yeah. But it's enough that you can be like, oh, OK, like I understand sequence of operation. I understand why I'm measuring what I'm measuring or why the effects are what they are. If you want to dive into it. Right. I mean, this is a full, um, you know, couple semester engineering course uh, that you could certainly take on the topic. Um, but it is it is really fascinating stuff. And again, we're just seeing it more and more. And and I think if you don't take anything else away other than just understanding the difference between analog and digital. Um, understanding that um, we really are kind of simulating these things. We're not, it's not exactly the same as alternating current. And that when you're seeing it across, um, you know, ECM, um, inverter driven, uh, variable frequency drives, it's still this, there's variations, but it's still the same core technology. It's the same fundamental technology. And then it's just a matter of how it's applied. And back to Corey's advice, you know, RTFM, uh, you get thrown into a situation where you're working on something you haven't seen before, understand your inputs, understand your sequence of operation, go back to your manufacturer's literature, understand the parameters and what they mean, know some of these sort of edges of like, oh, yeah, hey, I remember Matthew was telling me about bearing fluting uh, and damage to bearings that can happen <laughs> you to make sure that it's that, you know, that I I'll hey, remember we, that. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> that sort of stuff. So uh, anyway, any uh, any closing thoughts? We're already uh, a little bit, a little bit over here. I got a closing thought. Just, um, you know, don't throw a con just don't just be like, ah, inverters suck, BFDs suck. I'm gonna throw a contactor in there. Don't be that guy. <laughs> That's that. If there's nothing else you take from the class, just don't do that. L learn it. Read the manual. It's really honest. It's just sensors telling that VFD to speed up and slow down. And you just got to make it do that again. <laughs> a lot of different, a lot of different inputs that can drive VFDs. Yeah, the, and there's about... and those sensors can mess with your VFD. So it's not always the VFD. You can't change it twice and still does the same thing. You just got a bad batch of them. <laughs> <laughs> got a bad batch. I hate it when that happens. When you get a bad batch of VFDs. Yeah, those suckers are yeah, expensive. Just... They're just always putting yep. out bad VFDs. Yeah, to your point, say... like yeah, don't throw the bypass handle and just you know run the run the motors on. Uh, on uh, AC again, just because you can't figure out how the VFD works. So, you know, you see that kind of stuff happen yep. all the time. Try to understand how it works and take the time. Obviously, we all get busy and it gets tricky. But um, but yeah, um, Keith Peterson says, where do I add the inverter fluid? Uh, that's for another <laughs> podcast. Um, <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, guys. Um, you know, yep. Make sure to follow uh, Corey, Bad TXV on TikTok. Thank you. Thank um, you. And uh, give him some give him some love over there. And hey, if you ever follow Brian, too. Yeah, if you ever want to work on the fun <laughs> stuff, just come work at Kalos. Um, so, no, wait, did I say that? No. Anyway. Right. Thanks, thanks, guys. Thanks, Matthew. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you.